Hello, everyone. And if you have a Bible or device, I'd invite you to turn to the book of James near the back of our Bibles, and we'll be there in just a few moments. And if you're new, welcome to Woodside. Today we are starting a new series, Living Out Your Faith in Relationships. And I'd like to begin uh, with my relationship with my wife, Lisa. Many of you know, as we've been married almost 30 years, that we, in our 30 years of marriage, have never, ever had a disagreement, (laughs) a misunderstanding. Never have we struggled with an issue. Not once have we been defensive. Not once have we hurt the other with our words. Not once have we ever tried to fix or control the other. Uh, We've never criticized, and we've never gotten angry at each other. So I'm going to tell you about relationships. (laughs) Relationships take work. Whether you're married, if you're a parent with a child, uh, with friends, with people you work with at school, relationships take work. Now, just a biblical picture of relationships before we look at today's message. Uh, The God who made us, He created us out of relationship for relationship. He is a God of community. He is personal. He relates. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, before anything was created, they were in relationship. Three persons in one God. And that God made you, all of us here, all of those watching online, made you and me for a relationship with Him. That's the story of the Bible. That's the story of Jesus coming into our world to die on a cross to save us from our sins so that we could have a relationship forever with God. God made us for a relationship with Him. God also made us for a relationship with one another. That as we go through life, we're in relationship with other people. And God wants, as His followers, His people, He wants us to work at our relationships, to have deep and meaningful and healthy relationships. So I'm going to ask you as you begin, how are you doing in your relationships? God wants to speak to you during this six-week series. We're going to be looking at the letter of James. And in the letter of James, if you're to read it this week, the five chapters, uh, you will understand that it's about faith. Many of you know that. It's about faith. And what James does is he takes a saving faith in God through the person of Jesus, and he shows that it's a living faith. It's not a dead faith. That because we have a relationship with God, because of Christ's love for us, it changes how we do relationships. So he applies living faith to trials. When, when we face trials, here's, here's, what, here's how we respond. When we face temptation, here's how we respond. And when we are in relationships, this is how we do them. And uh, I want to begin today, too, if you're divorced or you've had a broken relationship, this series is not about shaming or guilt. This series is about helping all of us to work at our relationships so that we can have healthy and deep relationships. So as we begin today in the letter of John, we're going to start with an introduction. John's going to, uh, sorry, in James. James is going to give us an introduction, and then he's going to talk to us about communication because good relationships require good communication. And today we're going to look at three steps that James gives us to not simply get along better with people, but he gives us three steps that are God's will for us. And as we do these three steps, we'll be in a posture for better relationships. And out of the three, the first one, if you can take this first principle, this first practice, this first skill, and from today on say, I want that in my relationships, you will find God working in your relationships. And it's seek first to understand. Before you do anything else, Seek first to understand that you're ready to listen. If you're married to your spouse, to a child, to a friend. So let's begin James chapter 1, and we're looking at good communication today. James begins his letter. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. 
Now, when you read your Bible, the, the New Testament about the life of Jesus, you're going to find James mentioned again and again. This is not the James who is a disciple of Jesus, who is the brother of John. This is the brother of Jesus, his half-brother. In Matthew chapter 13, we are told that Jesus had four younger brothers. Same mother, different father, but same four younger brothers, and he had sisters as well. And in uh, Mark chapter 3, we're told that those brothers um, thought Jesus was crazy. That's why you don't see James, the brother of Jesus, when Jesus was feeding the 5,000 or when he was out in the boat and there was a, a storm. He's not there because he wasn't following Jesus. He thought Jesus, John 7, he thought Jesus was not only crazy, but as a brother of Jesus, he mocked Jesus. Hey, if you're who you say you are, why don't you take your circus to town, to Jerusalem, so you get more exposure he mocked Jesus. And yet the brother of Jesus, James, we find in the book of Acts that he was a leader in the church of Jerusalem. What happened that James would go from a disbeliever, an unbeliever, to a believer? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, after Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he appeared to James. And his brother realized that his brother really was the Son of God, God in flesh, and that he really rose from the dead. And when you follow the life of James, who wrote this letter, you won't find this in the Bible, but you will find it uh, in, in other literature. James would die for his faith in Jesus. Josephus, a Jewish historian writing for the Romans, tells us that James, the brother of Jesus, when he was presiding over the church at Jerusalem, uh, there was a, the governor at the time was Festus, who was the Roman governor of Judea. Think of Pontius Pilate years earlier. But this is Festus. He dies, and there's a gap be before the new Roman governor gets to town, to Jerusalem. Albino. And during that gap, the high priest at the time, who was Ananus, he decides that he's going to take matters into his own hands. The Roman leadership isn't there. Do you remember with Jesus, they had to get the Romans' permission to have Jesus crucified? You couldn't do it just with the Jewish leaders. You had to get the Roman permission. There's no real Roman leadership. So he takes matters into his own hands. And Josephus tells us that Jesus was stoned, or sorry, James was stoned to death. And then when the new governor of Binus comes in, he then removes Ananus from his position. So James would go to his death saying that Jesus is risen from the dead. He is Lord. But before he died, some 30 years after Jesus died and rose again, he wrote a letter. And he wrote it to notice from James to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. In the Old Testament, 12 tribes referred to the people of God. So he's writing to the people of God, primarily Jews, but it extends to Gentiles as well, to the people of God that were noticed scattered because they were fleeing for their lives. They were being persecuted. So they were outside of Jerusalem. James decided to stay in Jerusalem and was killed. So he's writing to them. Notice, too, how James, the brother of Jesus, identifies himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James doesn't bring attention to the fact that he's the brother of Jesus. I mean, would we want to do that? Hey, I'm James, the brother of Jesus. Now you need to listen to what I say because I have some clout. Don't you know who I am? He doesn't do that. He doesn't name drop. Instead, he says, I'm a servant of God, the Father, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he saw himself that he was serving the risen Lord, that he was humble. It was all about Jesus. Please note this. The closer you get to Jesus, the more humble you will become because you will see who he is and you will realize that life is not about you, but it's about him. So if you're a Christian who's, got, who's you know, arrogant or you know someone that's a Christian that's arrogant, they don't know Jesus very well. Because the closer we get to Jesus, the humbler we become. And so James says here, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now drop down to verse 19, and he's going to talk to us 
about what living faith looks like in our relationships. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. So write this down, and you're going to find in the the letter of James a lot of pithy, short statements, kind of like Proverbs. You're going to find a lot of teaching that's similar to the Sermon on the Mount. And in this book, you will find about 60 different commands. And so James is going to share three commands right away with us about relationships. So here we go. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, not some of you, but if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a servant, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. God wants you to be quick to listen. Before you do anything else, be quick to listen. Why? Because in any human relationship, both people want to be heard and understood. And our tendency is, is that we speak and we're heard and we understand and we're, we're understood, and then we listen. James says, no, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's the other way. You start by being quick to listen. And then he says, and slow to speak. The word slow has the idea of be late to speak. James is not saying here, hey, I'm an introvert, all you extroverts, just stop talking. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, don't be hasty in your speech because you need to realize your words have power. We live in a world, in a, in a culture, in a climate where people don't understand that their words have power and they're just so hasty with them. Verbally, look online, right? Just firing things off. James is very familiar with the writer of Proverbs who said in Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. That your words, whether you realize it or not, can be life-giving or they can be death-destroying. And whatever words you choose, they have a consequence. There's fruit. And if they're bad words, there's going to be bad fruit. And so he says, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Here's what we want to understand. The more that we come to our relationships with an attitude or posture where we're ready to listen, the more we're going to learn and understand and the less likely we will become angry. Because the more we understand, it leads to empathy. We're putting ourselves in their shoes and there'll be less anger. Uh, for myself, in my relationships uh, with my wife, my kids, I've had to learn this, to be slow, to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And that understanding has helped me to be less angry. Um, some of you know the story, but in my relationship with Lisa, um, when we uh, were engaged and uh, dating and then engaged, uh, we never had one big argument, one misunderstanding. We were just like, it was great. And then we got married. And after we got married, we moved into a condominium. And in this condominium, it had uh, uh, mint walls. You ever picture those? Mint walls? Come on now. Mint walls. And I remember that first they had this blank wall, and there were two pictures that we had. So I knew that Everybody knows that when there's a blank wall, you put the two pictures in the middle of the wall. Oh, did I have a lot to learn. You don't put the two pictures in the wall. So we together are listening and trying to understand each other in our marriage, and we're kind of like cutting things down, and then, oh, there's a child, some, something else in the equation. So then we, with one child, kind of get that down. Then there's a second child, kind of get that down. Then there's a third child, kind of get that down, Right? And during that whole time, we had to listen and understand so that there'd be less anger. One particular occasion, I was eating my lunch, and I was eating a ham sandwich, and it was awful, but I finished it. Later that day, my wife Lisa says to me, how was your ham sandwich? I said, that was the worst ham ever. You need to throw it out. To which she replied, it wasn't the ham. I put a post-it note in your sandwich. (laughs) And the post-it note said something to the fact that, you know, I'm sorry or something like that about our argument and will you, uh, or I love you. So I literally ate her apology. (laughs) 
in all our relationships, we've got to work. And if you want better relationships, it means you're coming to every one of them quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Uh, it, it's a habit that Stephen Covey in his book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks about. It's habit number five. I read this when I was young. Young people, it's a great book to get. Uh, but habit five says this, seek first to understand, then to be understood. He's basically paraphrasing James. Don't go to a conversation to your kids that they're going to understand you. Seek first to understand them, which means you're asking questions, which means you're listening which means you're kind of listening to understand as opposed to listening to reply, right? That's something we all need to work on. Listening to reply is when the other person is talking and you're not really tracking with them because your mind is consumed with what you're going to say in response. Listening to understand is where like, okay, I can just park that and I'm going to try to hear what they're saying. I'm going to try to see what they're feeling. I'm going to try to better understand them. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. If you can learn that skill, that practice, your relationships will improve because God at least work on you. So James gives us, you want good relationships, you need good communication, so here's what you do. But he's telling this not simply because he's writing a self-help book and he says, hey, I want you all to get, get along better and be nice. He's telling us this because it's God's will for you and for me. He goes on to say this uh, in verses 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because, I'm going to tell you why, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You have a relationship with God, then you have a relationship with people, and in your relationship with God, He does not want you to express human anger. He wants you to work towards being right with someone else. Now, he's not talking about divine anger or righteous anger. There's a place we ought to get upset when someone is hurt or, 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 or terrible things you know, happen to someone. We need to advocate and, and to have our voice heard. We need to do that, but we're doing it in a way where we're not reverting to human anger, where we're blowing up and we're just... we're. Um, we're taking things into our own hands. Now, I'm not sure about you, where you fall on the uh, anger response spectrum. Maybe you're here and you are explosive. You fly off the handle. You slam the door. You yell. You're a bright red like a lobster, right? That's you. Or maybe you're more implosive, where you're just like you keep it inside. And someone says to you, hey, what's wrong? Nothing, right? Nothing. And so there's a silent treatment or you're passive aggressive. Where are you? Because we all respond to anger in some way. I was kind of in the middle, um, you know, and my wife has brought this to my attention more than once uh, with her and the kids is my response to anger. I would not get upset and fly off the handle. Neither would I give the silent treatment. But what I would do was is my tone would change. And she said, you're, you're angry. And I'd say, no, I'm not. I never raised my voice. I never slammed my fist down. I didn't use bad language. Oh, but your voice changed, a little tone. Oh, so I have had to work on being gentle. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. Harshness is not. So I had to work on that because... I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and because I don't want to not do His will. His will is that I'm not doing that. So I've had to work at it. Let me just say, in our relationships with people, in our relationships with, with people that aren't followers of Jesus, so your family and then outside of that, that's God's will for you, is that you don't express human anger. Human anger is a, I want it my way. You need to see it my way. We're at the cultural climate at the time, we see that everywhere, right? People are just talking at each other. Nobody's listening, right? There's this issue we've just had. There's going to be another issue, right? If you don't learn how to control your anger, 
if you don't learn to listen and be quick listening, another issue is going to come along and it's going to affect you and you're going to respond the wrong way, right? But in this past issue, it was like, you know, I'm vaccinated, not vaccinated. I'm mass, not vaccinated. Church is open, church is closed and, and that whole thing. And then you get tribes on either side, right? And what are they doing online? They're, there's human anger. and People are just mad at each other. Then you have the whole cancel culture thing, uh, which is not new, but it's been named. But you got cancel culture where if you don't agree with me, if I don't like what you say, I'm going to cancel everything about you. And so that's the climate we're in. Is it any wonder that studies show that anger is on the increase? It has been for a while now. Does it any wonder that studies, one just came out by the University of Michigan, on empathy, it's gone way down in the last two to three decades? Why? Because nobody's listening to each other. Everybody's just talking. And what can happen is the spirit and the climate out there can come into a church if you're not careful. And we need to remind ourselves that that is not God's will. In a world, in a culture where everything's politicized, that's not God's will for us. Do we say to, to if whatever side you're on, do you say, hey, no, um, I think we should do this. I think we should do that. Yes, but it's with a posture of wanting to talk and dialogue and listen and understand. That's what God wants for you and for me. And so James says it doesn't produce what God wants in your life. It's not his will. And James lived it out. He didn't simply speak it. He lived it out in Acts chapter 15. I encourage you to go there this week and read that chapter. But here is James. He's presiding over a bunch of leaders in the church who have gotten together because there were issues in the day. 2,000 years ago, can you believe that? In the church, there were issues. It was whether or not we should eat meat sacrificed to idols. Some Christians said, you know what? It's just meat. Those idols, they're dead. They're, you know, they're, they're not real gods. Just buy the meat. There was others that say, don't you touch that. It's been offered to an idol. So in the market, there was this, what, what do Christians do? And then you had the circumcision issue and other issues. And so they got together in Acts chapter 15. And what does James do? Well, if you read it, we find that Peter and Barnabas, they've been going around, they share, they start talking. Then some Jewish believers, very steeped in the Mosaic law and had a certain view, they start talking. And then Peter starts talking. And then we read, and kind of when everybody had finished talking, James spoke. Sought first to understand, then to be understood. And James helped them come to a consensus so that the church continued to flourish and move on. After James was killed, uh, he was referred to as James the Just because he wanted to do what was right and he cared about people. And James was following his brother, who was the one who said, listen, don't get into an us, them, and we got to win mentality. That's not my kingdom. It's not about winning. It's about loving. And we see this over and over again in Scripture. In Luke chapter 9, let's look at Jesus. Luke chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples are moving from Galilee in the north, in the land of Israel, to Judea in the south where Jerusalem is, and they're going to make their way through the middle province, Samaria. And almost all Jews at the time would never go through Samaria. They'd always go around Samaria because Samaria had Samaritans, and Jews and Samaritans hated each other. But Jesus loves all people, all races, and so he loved the Samaritans. So he sends a couple of folks on ahead, a couple guys up ahead to kind of make lodging for the night. These guys go into Samaria and they get a very frosty reception. Basically, we don't want you staying here, like get lost. They go back to Jesus and the other disciples and share, you know, kind of what the Samaritans are like. And James and John say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? They kind of fit in with today's culture, wouldn't they? <laughs> Aus them, Samaritans, destroy them. What does Jesus do? He rebukes them. That, that's not how you do it when you're following me. In uh, Matthew 
chapter 26, the them, the Jewish leaders, come with clubs and swords and some Romans to arrest Jesus in the garden. And this time it's Peter, and Peter draws his sword. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Peter, that's not how you do it in my kingdom. And then on the cross in uh, Luke 23, here's Jesus hanging on a cross for our sins, and people are mocking him. He's got nails. He's nailed to the cross. He had every single right to get down from the cross and obliterate everyone. But because his purpose was not to come and win and set everybody right, his purpose was bigger than that. It was to love people into his kingdom, that there's a bigger enemy that he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And James, the brother of Jesus, that's the one he was following. So he was like, it's not about winning and losing. It's about bringing my brother Jesus. It's about loving him to other people, and human anger doesn't do that. In fact, James will say in verse 21, this is what you're to do when you feel like you're angry. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Notice the phrase, get rid of. Paul uses that kind of terminology. Uh, Peter alludes to it. When you became a Christian, when you came into a relationship with God through Jesus, you still have your old nature. You're to throw it off. You know that anger that you want to express? Throw it off. You know those bad words that you want to say? Throw them off. Instead, you are to throw on, put on what God says. You're to humbly accept the Word. In other words, God, in your relationship with Him, wants you to listen to Him. He says, notice there, humbly accept the Word planted in you which can save you. You'll notice in verse 18, James talks about the word there. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. What's the word? It's the gospel, the good news about Jesus, the word of God, the word of Christ. You heard about Jesus. You trusted him as your savior, and you were born again. You received birth through the word. So he's talking about a saving faith in verse 18. But in verse 21, he's talking about a living faith, a sanctifying faith. Just as you listened to God and you were saved, now, as you go through life, let that word that's implanted in you, you're to humbly accept it. Note this. Instead of doing things my way, I'm going to say to God, God, I'm listening to you. I humbly accept. And the word accept there is dekomai in the Greek, which literally means to welcome like a stranger. So the picture James is sharing with us is someone that you don't really know showing up at your doorstep, and you're not sure whether to let that person in or not, and then you decide to welcome them. Hey, come on in. Can I get you a coffee? Can I get you a tea? That's what he's saying about Jesus, God, and his word. That there's times that you're not sure, do I really want to follow God and his word? Do I really want to do this? Because it seems like I should do this instead. And James says, no, welcome, humbly accept the word of God. Say to God, you're going to do it. I'm going to do it your way. You see, sometimes, or perhaps, if you've got a lot of problem issues with people, you may not have a people issue. It might be a God issue. If you're not listening to people, it might be that you're not listening to God. When we become better listeners with God, we become better listeners with people. So God, what do you want me to do in this relationship? What do you want me to say or not say? And you're learning to humbly accept that which he's created. And then James says, when you do that, it will save you. What does it save you from? It'll save you from expressing human anger. It will save you from saying words that you wish you had never said. It will save you from always having to be right and never listening to your child and driving your child away. It will save you from destroying your marriage. It will save you from saying things you shouldn't say. In other words, God wants you to have his word 
as a growing presence in your life, you're just more and more saying, God, I want to do it your way. In fact, one of the marks of a growing Christian is the Christian that says, God, I feel like doing this, but I want you to tell me how to live. What should I do in this situation? What do you say in your word? And sometimes God, it takes um, some of God's people saying, hey, you know what? Here's what you should maybe do, but you want to do his will. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Listen to God and then listen to other people. And then he goes on, John goes on, to, or James rather, goes on to talk about the word and its presence in our life. Verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, into the word that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James says that if you listen to God and you humbly accept it and you do it, you will be blessed. Here's the challenge with our fallen natures. We don't always want to do what God says. Sometimes it's hard. In fact, there's some people that used to believe in the Bible, but it says a lot of things that are hard, and they're like, no, I'm not sure I believe that anymore. I'm not sure I'm going to do that anymore. I'm not sure I'm going to live that way anymore. We have to realize it's hard for us sometimes to do what God says because we have an enemy. Jesus referred to him as Satan in the spiritual realm. He's a spirit being. He's working in our world, and he wants to destroy our relationships. He wants us to express human anger again and again. He wants us not to be quick to listen. He wants to be, us to be quick to speak. The first man and the first woman in the garden had a perfect relationship with God, and they had a perfect relationship with one another. The enemy comes, and what were the first words out of his mouth? What did he speak to the first man and first woman? Did God really say? I don't think God wants what's best for you. I don't think you should listen to him. You should just do what you want to do, and they did. And today, fast forward to where we are today, there's people who I know better than God. I know God says to do this in his word, but no, that doesn't apply to me. We're in 2022, for Pete's sake, right? Why would I listen to that God? And James tells us that we can do what we want to say, but we do, but we will not be blessed. The person that's blessed, all things are well with that person, is the person that says, Lord, I want to do it your way, which means we have to go again and again and listen to him. James tells us that when we open his word and we listen to him, it's like a mirror just like a mirror reflects what you look, we look like, a mirror reflects, his word reflects what's going on in our hearts. And James says, don't just glance at the mirror and not do anything, do something, right? How many of you this morning, you got up and you looked at the mirror, but you didn't do anything, right? I don't think there's a person here, right? Thank you for, for doing something. But James says, when it comes to God's word, listen to him. So instead of like, oh, that person said that hurtful word, that person is, you know, holding me at a distance, and that person is this and this. You open the word, and you say, Lord, what's going on in my heart? Why am I so upset? Why am I so jealous? Why am I so envious? Why do I want to be popular? Why all of these things? It's like a mirror, and there we can make corrections. Lord, I'm giving that person to you. Would you work on my life? Lord, I can't change that person but you can change me. How do you want me to respond? And this is where the sovereignty of God comes in again and again. God is either in control or he's not. And when you begin to let God work in you, then he begins to change you, which means you stop trying to fix the other person. You stop trying to control the other person. You stop trying to enforce your way on the other person. Lord, I give this person to you work on me. So James says it's like a mirror. Where are you today with your relationships? If you're married or you have children or you have friends, 
People at work, where are you with your relationships? God's will for you is that you will be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And if you will take that seek first to understand approach, every relationship, I want to listen and learn that you will begin to have better relationships. Maybe you're here today, and in your relationship, you, relationships, you've always raised your voice. Or maybe you've been cynical, and you've always been cynical and sarcastic. Or maybe you've always had to have the last word. Or maybe you just have a lecture style. Or maybe you always winning arguments, you're just driving people away. Or maybe you've stopped listening to people. That's not God's will for you. Today, would you say, oh Lord, I want to learn to listen to you better and help me to listen to other people better. If you're here today, and you've hurt people and you've drove people away because driven people away because of, of your words and just in that relationship? Have you asked for forgiveness? Have you gone to certain people in your life and you said, Will you forgive me? Not I'm sorry, but, but under your relationship with God. You say, I'm sorry, that was not right. Will you forgive me? Or if you're here and you've been hurt by someone, betrayed by someone, someone has rejected you. How are you doing? Are you carrying anger and resentment and all kinds of things? Because God wants to work in your heart and say, listen, I want you to give that to me. Yes, you need to talk to the person, and if you've talked and they're not changing, Lord, I give that person to you. God wants us to have better relationships. I'm going to ask you to stand, and in just a moment we're going to pray. Before I pray, I'm going to invite you to take a few moments, and if you'd like to bow your heads, and would you, is there, is there some, are there some relationships that you want to just take a few moments and say, thank you, God, for these relationships, and I love these people, and then maybe you're here today, and Lord, this is the relationship, or these are relationships I'm listing, lifting up to you. I'm not doing well, this relationship. Lord, would you help me to do your will? Take a few moments to respond, and then I will. Heavenly Father, I'm lifting up Woodside to you, and I thank you for all the people here, for those watching online. And Father, I'm asking that you will help us all, every one of us, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Lord, help us to be better listeners. Help us to respect all people that you bring across our paths. Help us to respect them by the way that we listen without interrupting, without being defensive, without blowing up. Oh, Lord, help us to be better listeners. Those times we fall short, Lord, help us to seek your forgiveness. But, Lord, we want to do your will, will so help us. Help us as a church family to shine in this dark age. Help us to love even those that we may deem not worthy of it. Lord, help us to love others like you loved us. We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen.